Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. Five years after it last happened, ministers confirmed they are again considering the future of the Royal Marines' two amphibious assault ships. Then the Defence Secretary reveals he's asked the head of the Royal Navy for a plan for taking forward the Marines' work. Mike will explain what's going on and a former Commandant General of the Royal Marines will give us his assessment. My message to the Defence Secretary would be, you know, think very, very, very carefully about what you're doing. You know, war is, you have to spit, not dribble. Also on SIPREP, HMS Richmond is the latest Royal Navy ship to sail to the Red Sea. HMS Diamond shoots down a string of drones and the Defence Secretary issues a stark warning to the Houthis who are firing them. If this doesn't stop, uh, then action will be taken. Watch this space. British sailors are on watch round the clock in that space. We'll hear what it's like for them. And learning life lessons from military training, which at any moment can become a real emergency. It was only by chance I looked at the sonar screen and went, something's not right there, tapped on it. The periscope watchkeeper went deep in emergency and you could see pure fear on his eyes. Zitrap with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. So, on Monday, MPs were told no decision has been taken on the future of the landing platform dock ships HMS Bulwark and HMS Albion. Confirming, in not so many words, reports that these LPDs could be mothballed. Then they hear the Defence Secretary has asked for a plan for the future work of the Royal Marines. Uh, So, Mike, uh, what options do you think the First Sea Lord might be looking at? Well, the option of retiring Bulwark and Albion is always not far from the top of the agenda. I mean, I was sitting on the Defence Committee as an advisor when it came round five years ago, and there was hell to pay about the idea that Bulwark and Albion might be retired because they're very specialist ships and you know if you lose them you won't get them back but you don't really nobody can quite see when they might be required in the near future but of course warfare is such that you the things always creep up on you so we're going round in in these usual circles about whether britain really needs a literal raiding ability to land supplies and and heavy equipment and marines on hostile shores as opposed to going in by air or by ports and and so on and the argument comes round about every five years or so and this is the present iteration of it I think and Mike on top of that it looks like retirement is also being considered for two Royal Navy frigates is there some kind of mini defense review going on for the Navy and Marines Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Not a a, a mini review in any conscious way, but the the staffing levels, the actual personnel levels in the Navy are now really parlous in terms of ability to crew the ships. You're talking about 200 people on every destroyer, every frigate, and usually you need two crews, uh, one crew that's um, on R&R and one crew that may be taking a ship to sea. And we've reached the point where the, the Navy simply can't staff all of the ships that it could actually put to sea, which is a strange situation to be in. So that's where we are with it. I think the um, the idea of retiring a couple of frigates early or, or mothballing them for a while is not militarily sensible. You need all the frigates you can get, and we've got so few of them. But if you can't crew them, then the frigates are going to do nothing but sort of stay alongside for quite a while. Well, the biggest questions right now do seem to be about what the future holds for the Royal Marines. Major General Buster Howes is a former Commandant General of the Corps and also sat on the Royal Navy Board. What does he make of it all? Blue Sarchange, in a way. I mean, we've been around this boy without wishing to labour the metaphor um, many times, I think. We've just been embroiled for the last two decades in continental wars where we've had our arm firmly into a mangle and not been able to extract it. And the ability to re-statically apply sort of coercive power by poising a force offshore and then being able to sensitively and responsibly, according to the political circumstance, utilise troops that are on board that ship. You know, the, the value of that is self-evident. All this is about money. This is not about clear-sighted logic. 
And if HMS Bulwark and HMS Albion were to be retired, how much difference would that make to the Royal Marines? Well, the Royal Marines are uh, an immensely flexible organisation. Their value lies in all sorts of levels, but not least in the human capital which resides there. The Corps makes up less than 3% of defence numerically in terms of the number of people in it, but provides 39% of British Special Forces. So if you just look at the, the, the quality of the people and their ability just to get things done, but their primary role is amphibious. They are sea soldiers and... HMS Ocean has gone, and the two LPDs, the landing platform docks, which allow surface assault, in other words, they contain eight landing craft. One is a vehicle personnel, which is smaller than the LCU utility, which takes vehicles. But they can take about 400 men, 710, I think, when they're really squished in. 64 vehicles and they can launch that force ashore without that it will have profound effect on britain's ability to project force ashore if that is what is required just to sum that note there are still the three rfa bay class amphibious vessels that can be used of course they're not the same as bulwark and albion but can you explain to the lay person how much of a gap they could or couldn't fill well, the RFAs were originally built to cross the channel to help with the reinforcement of the British Army of the Rhine. And so they're, they're much smaller, they're less capable, and they have a completely different function. I mean, the Bay class can do some of it, but it's this business of being, you have to have a sustainable mass. You know, war is, you have to spit, not dribble. If you're going to establish a beachhead ashore, you need to have a credible and competent force. There are some uh, who argue when hard decisions have to be taken, we could do without troops trained for amphibious assault, that our capabilities to parachute in airborne troops can deliver the same effect. What do you make of that argument? And to use your terminology, is that more dribbling than spitting then? Well, people love to compare the, the Royal Marines and the Parachute Regiment. I mean, they're quite different temperamentally, but they're also very different in their function. You can only jump with what you can carry. You can chuck a pallet out of the back of an aircraft with stuff on it, but an aircraft can only carry a limited amount. And so the parachute regiment are there for 24 hours before they need to be reinforced. What would the Royal Marines take in on an amphibious landing that the Paris can't? Well, it's... it's it's sustainability, it's materiel, you know, it's beans, bullets and band-aids. I think from the top of my head, a landing platform dock like Bulwark or Albion can carry about two to three weeks worth of combat power. They're both forcible entry troops. They're both designed for assault rather than defence. So, uh, you know, I don't see it as either or. That's a sort of nil-sum game, which is idiocy. They have different functions. But... Grant Shapps has recently been talking about uh, alleviating the absolutely unconscionable suffering in Gaza, you know, possibly providing humanitarian supplies across the beach at Gaza, which the Israelis control. The LPDs would be absolutely central to that because you've got to secure it. That is a highly unstable and dangerous environment. You're not just going to drive trucks ashore. You're going to have to establish a beachhead and protect it. I mean, there's a perfect example of the utility of these things. 93% of the population of the globe lives within 100 miles of the sea. And as climate change starts wreaking increasing havoc, and if we see ourselves as an international actor and we wish to intervene, you know, as a global player for, for good, then these vessels are key to that. Um, the Defence Secretary is insisting the Royal Marines are not having to justify their existence or, some, or are somehow under threat. He tweeted, uh, Royal Marines are absolutely essential. I've commissioned a plan on how their work and capabilities can be bolstered and enhanced to protect Britain from a world that is growing more dangerous. If you were writing that plan, what would your message to the Defence Secretary be? It takes about two decades to undo or correct or change or produce something you get rid of. So my message to the Defence Secretary would be, 
you know, think very, very, very carefully about what you're doing because you can't undo it. You could put you could put these LPDs into extended readiness. I mean, mothball them essentially, but then they're not there, and you can't flash them up again. But if you delete them, if you send them off to India and convert them to razor blades, it'll be another thirty years. That's a really big call, a really big call. But as far as the core is concerned, I would say this, wouldn't I? You know, I have a tribal loyalty to an organisation which I work for for thirty four years, but I'm also I'm also a taxpayer and I'm very clear sighted about life. And it seems to me that there is so much flexibility in the organization because the people are so good. They really are. You know, I've worked around the world with foreign forces, but also in purple appointments. I was the head of overseas operations in the Ministry of Defense. You know, I was intimately involved in Afghanistan and Iraq. I ran the counter piracy force in uh, uh, again in the Bab al Mandeb against the Somali pirates. I was involved in Bosnia and Northern Ireland, and you know I would say objectively that the, the Royal Marines pound for pound could be stacked up against any fighting force in the world, and I wouldn't say that about all British forces. So think carefully. Major General Buster House, great to speak to you. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Uh, Mike, um, Buster House there thinks it's about money, but media reports claim, along with the possible retirement, HMS Argyle and HMS Westminster, it's actually about difficulty recruiting and retaining enough sailors to crew every ship with the new Type 26s and 31s on order. What do you think? Yes, uh, I mean, it's, recruitment is a problem at the moment, but retention is a bigger problem across all of the forces because for all sorts of reasons. But I mean, people who've been expensively trained then leave maybe five or six years earlier than they might otherwise have left. So the forces lose very important skills and experience. And so it's both recruitment and retention, but also the recruiting policies, which have been centralized and outsourced um, over recent years, have just failed. Simple as that. Well, let's talk now once again to former Royal Navy Commander Tom Sharp, who has become our go-to guy for explaining all things maritime here on SITREP. Uh, Tom, really good to speak to you again. What do you think about what Buster Howes had to say? I think one of the one of the things that really struck me was was when he was talking about um, short term financial decisions with long term implications. And there's a very small example of this that is really coming home to roost today. In uh, 23 years ago, by my calculations, we took the decision to get rid of the anti-aircraft capability of our main cannon, the four and a half inch gun on the front of the ships. It was deemed not required. The way to take out a missile was to use another missile. That was the that was the thinking. So, so for a few pounds, they took the software out of the gun, uh, and now look, um, we are at HMS Diamond engaging. Uh, Twenty thousand dollar drones with with one and a half million pound missiles for the sake of this bit of software. So a really good example of, of short termism to save a few pounds. 20 years later, that requirement is right back at you uh, and, uh, and costing you way more down the line. A really salutary lesson. And we'll talk a bit more about HMS Diamond in a moment. If it is about freeing up people, though, to crew the next generations of warships, how many people would the retirement of these four vessels free up? Firstly, I, I'm I'm not sure that it is. I think this is about saving the money that would need to be spent on those two ships to get them back on the front line. The, the people element of this is definitely part of it, but it's not the reason. And the, and the reason I say that is because ships companies don't just magically appear on another ship. Even if a decommissioning Type 23 was on one side of a jetty and a commissioning Type 26 was on the other, you wouldn't get a direct transfer of people from one to the other. You just lose people along the way because that's the way the complexity of our manpower and the specific requirements of different roles is such that it just doesn't work that way. And I, I remember when the Type 22s paid off in 2011, there were four of them. And I was at sea in command of HMS and Albans, and we all assumed that our gapping problems – I mean, that's another interesting point. They've always been there, these shortages. But we assumed that they would go away overnight, and they just didn't. Those four ship's companies melted into the ether. And and the Royal Navy and Marines have a full-time train strength of 29,000. The majority of those are not routinely at sea. It's tempting to say, surely they can find those hundreds by cutting shore-based jobs. I'm, I'm guessing you're going to say that won't transfer either. For, you look at 29,000 and you think there must be a lot of flexibility in, in that, but you have to just look at the entire productivity of the Navy, the general service, 
the submarine service, the deterrent, the the air, the, the fleet air arm, you know, and the Royal Marines. And we got these huge subcarders. And if you just take the general service and you subdivide that into into the, all the different carders of people, and there, there are twenty or thirty, and then you break them down still further into the chefs, the radar operator, the the communicator you end up with very small numbers. And this is the problem we're in right now. As the as the number attenuates to zero, which it has been since 1945, the squeeze gets exponentially worse. The gaps get proportionately bigger. So whilst retention and recruiting has been a problem all the way through my time in the, in the Navy, we've always been under understaffed and people have always been leaving. Uh, that problem gets it feels like it's getting worse. And that's why I think we're at a little bit of a tipping, uh, a little bit of a tipping point now. Uh, Mike, given the first Type 26 is three years away from being commissioned, could it make any sense to be talking about retiring on mothballing vessels right now? Well, only as Tom says, to, to save immediate money. It doesn't make any strategic sense to be retiring vessels early or mothballing them because we need all the ships we, we can get. I mean, although the first sea lord can speak very um, convincingly about the laydown of British forces, you look you know, from the Gulf to the Red Sea, to the Mediterranean, to the Atlantic, we've got, we've got you know, the naval presence in lots of parts of the world that are very important and they're doing pretty important jobs. But we've got one ship doing all of these various things. Things. Um, we, we need all of the vessels we've got if we're taking on all these various tasks. So it doesn't make any strategic sense uh, except to save current operating costs, which is what I suspect it's all about. Well, we should not forget that right now hundreds of Royal Navy sailors are engaged in dangerous operations in the Red Sea where missiles and drones are being fired at shipping by Houthi forces in Yemen. We'll talk about the big picture in a moment, but let's just focus on what's happened on Tuesday night. 18 drones, two cruise missiles and one ballistic missile were shot down by the US and UK. Seven of those drones were taken down by HMS Diamond and her company. Uh, Tom, the Ministry of Defence has at least a handful of photos from Diamond during those events of Tuesday night. What do they tell you about what is was happening? Yeah, that was an extraordinary night. Um, not the first. This is the 100 and, 116 missiles and drones have been fired since the 26th of October. So the bottom of the Red Sea is an extraordinary environment and, and has been for some time. And the ships there have been on high alert for some time, and I did uh, I did some sums. You know, a ballistic missile at 2,000 miles an hour will give the ships 30 seconds notice to respond. Mm. So they have to maintain that around the clock and have been for weeks. So it's it's a tough gig, uh, and the people on there will be uh, will be on high alert. If we talk about recruiting and retaining, of course, those pictures that come out, I, I guarantee you, nobody in HMS Diamond right now is putting their notice in to resign because they're there. They're doing they're doing the business that they were, mm. they were trained to do, and it, and it's exciting. But it's also going to be very very uh, tense. And yes, the 21 drones and missiles fired um, the other night, all of which were engaged we had diamond on the vhf radio so an, an insecure circuit telling all the merchant vessels to increase to full full ahead i mean this is sort of world war ii convoy stuff it's it's kind of extraordinary uh, and testament to was well, testament to a couple of things first is that is the is the capability of the coalition ships that are there there aren't enough but the ones that are there are doing a fantastic job and it's testament to the fact that the strong words coming out of the White House and the Pentagon and and Whitehall are, are not working. And and the end product is that the shipping companies are not reassured. They are mm. um, increasingly rerouting with all the penalties that that incurs. So Operation Prosperity Guardian in its entirely defensive mode right now isn't working. You described it as, as a tough gig. It does actually sound like one of the most dangerous operations the Royal Navy has been on for a long time. Um, you talk about it being um, quite exciting, although you know quite tense. Um, what will it be like for those who are on board HMS Diamond? Yeah, it's a very strange feeling. You, you train for this a lot, and that's a cliche. Of course, the training kicks in, and it does. But but there's a difference. You know, when when the training finishes, you go home for a cup of tea. These guys and girls will not have that option available to them. And of course, if it goes wrong, then then it's um, very, very much more serious. So there's that extraordinary sense of uh, sort of adrenaline. And there's a, you know, if you hear air threat warning red or the missile uh, detector blows a whistle in the ops room to get everyone's attention to say that there's a seek ahead that's locked onto you, you know, those are extraordinary moments and they, they make or break you. At the moment, Diamond is, is re responding exactly as you'd expect, you know, really, really well. And, and so they will be buzzing on board. But if that comes with a penalty, you can't sustain that forever. 
uh, and so they need, we need rotation. And very quickly, you come back to the uh, the conversation about numbers of ships. Yeah, Tom, um, in those photos from HMS Diamond, we can see the crew in white overalls, anti-flash hoods and protective gloves. Does that tell us something about just how serious the situation is? Yeah, so they would have been at action stations. Ships divide their, their work up into, th- there are three sort of uh, models in which you can steam around. There's, there's what's called cruising watches, where you go from A to B. There's defense watches where you split the ship in half and you do six hours on, six hours off, or, or variations thereof. And then there's action stations. Everyone's up. Every weapon is manned. Every sensor is on. If you know an attack is coming uh, and you can get your ship into that state, then that's what you would do. So, so the anti-flash, they will be wearing the overalls all the time. Uh, that's part of being in defense watches. So you're at immediate notice to move up one into the action state. The fact that they've got their hoods up um, is because they were under under live missile attacks. So yeah, they were in, at action stations, but you can't sustain that because nobody sleeps. So that's where the captain earns his money, when to go to it, and sometimes more difficult, when to come out of it. And Mike, as we speak, we are in a situation where the US, UK and other allies have now given repeated warnings to the Houthis that there will be consequences if these attacks do not stop. At some point, we have to put up or shut up. What's the tipping point uh, for this Western alliance moving from defence to offence and striking back against the Houthis? Well, the tipping point might have been yesterday when this big attack came in because the warning was first made on the 3rd of January there will be consequences and the Houthis have not just ignored it but they've defied it in pretty obvious ways. But I suspect that nothing has happened in the last 24 hours. The the tipping point will be the next attack if there is one. Um, So I think even a, a relatively small attack in the next 24 hours would actually be the tipping point. But if there isn't one, then it's possible that the thing would ramp back a little bit. But... You know, for sure, military preparations have been made. The intelligence services are fully onto this. I mean, the the coalition is ready to go. I suspect they they might go anyway. So I think we're just in that slightly grey area. Although the defence secretary was sort of using strange language, saying, "Well, enough is enough. Watch this mm-hmm. space." He was a bit more assertive than his American counterparts, who just kept repeating, "There will be consequences. Don't believe that there won't be." Um, so I think it's I think it's fifty fifty that there'll be a response in. The the next 24 hours if the houthis attack again there will certainly be a response mike ready to go and do what well some form of, of of attacks i mean it could be demonstrative that is taking out some facilities that we know the houthis have in order to show that we know where they are and, they, and we can do a lot more or it might be a quite a big response but we have to be aware that politically this is quite fraught because the houthis are not a tin pod guerrilla group they've taken over a lot of sophisticated military equipment in the last few years since they've controlled the north of yemen and they've got you know air land and and various sea forces so that it's not it's not a small force they're a bit like uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon they, they're almost organized in a rather conventional way and behind them of course is Iran so there's a lot of it would be a military response with a lot of political messaging to Iran that, that we the West are prepared to escalate unless you the Iranians are going to call a halt to this and now that there's a United Nations Security Council resolution as of last night which backs up this will to keep the Red Sea open, then I think the Iranians will be on the back foot if there is military um, action, but it will be dangerous. Tom, HMS Richmond is the latest Royal Navy ship to head to the Red Sea. The government says it's to potentially relieve Diamond or Lancaster. Just remind us of the capabilities of Richmond and what it has for this operation. Richmond and Lancaster are pretty similar in that they're both Type 23 frigates. They're both aging um, gracefully. There is one major difference, which is that Richmond has a towed array sonar, the 2087 towed array sonar, which is a bit of kit you can string out of the back, and it gives you tremendous capabilities for detecting uh, submarines. Is there a requirement for Richmond's towed array in the Red Sea? Not not really. Uh, in fact, the depth of water there and the lack of manoeuvrability, it would be, it'd be much better if she didn't have that out and was just there as, a, as an air defense picket in the same way that, uh, that the Lancaster is, is doing. Um, if she replaces the Type 45, that's an interesting sort of tactical decision because you're taking away the longer range radar, the longer range missiles and replacing it with something slightly shorter. But if Diamond was using guns to engage um, some of these drones, and we believe um, she was, 
miles, you know, we are talking about um, whites of the eyes here, one or two miles, in which case the, the, the 23 with, with um, her missile system is perfectly suited to that. So this is about just getting the, the working frigate that we have uh, out of the door and into the region because it gives us options. I think that's the mm. critical point in all of this. It's about providing political options, and you can't do that from alongside in Portsmouth Harbour. But what about her capabilities for targeting underwater drones, which have also been used? How well equipped is she for that? She will have um, various uh, ways of doing that. She'll have uh, her own torpedoes. I don't know whether which helicopter she's going with, which type of helicopter, because that will make a difference. And we deployed to the Gulf with depth charges, which looks remarkably like a sort of World War II device because they were, um, because if you want to tackle very small underwater threats in very shallow water, that's that's a good option. But I don't think the underwater threat there is being particularly amplified. I, I mean, we haven't seen mines yet. Let's just tick that off of the threat that, that could easily happen. Much more likely um, to have mines, I think, than any credible underwater threat. Personally, I don't think her um, incredible sonar capability will really come into play so long as she's in the in the Red Sea. The minute she goes back round to the Gulf, if she then takes up that forward position in Bahrain, uh, and you're now looking at the Iranian threat or bat, then the then the underwater sonar capability becomes more important. Tom Sharp, really good to speak to you. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. News, discussions, and analysis. This is Sitrep. Well, Tom has just given us an insight into the pressures of commanding a vessel and crew taking life or death decisions when every second counts. But how do you learn to do that? A former submarine commander who went on to lead the Royal Navy's submarine command course is now sharing the inside story of that training, which he describes as the most demanding leadership course in the world. Ryan Ramsey's new book, A View From Below, also offers lessons from that course that he says can help us all deal with pressure and be better leaders. It details seemingly impossible scenarios faced by officers acting as duty captain of a real submarine at sea. In this one, the sub's nuclear reactor has gone into emergency shutdown and there's a fire in the galley. As you're absorbing this report, the plainsman calls out the depth. They are losing control of the bubble, the angle of the boats. The problem is they have no power from the reactor and they're reliant on the battery, which can only provide a much slower speed. They're bringing water into the submarine to make it heavier, which will help it get back on depth. And they can do that quickly. But what they can't do is pump out the water as quickly. And this means if the submarine gets too heavy, it will start sinking. The only way to control this is to increase the speed while you pump the water out. And because of the reactor scram, you don't have that capacity. Ryan, thank you for that. And thanks for joining us on SITREP. That's just one of the many seemingly impossible situations you describe from the submarine command course. You were the teacher for that one, but you've been through the course yourself. What's it like to be faced with a situation like that for the first time? It's um, it's a very strange experience, slightly surreal. It doesn't seem like it's, it's happening at all. You go very much into an auto mode because your training kicks in. You're making snap second decisions. The safety of the crew is, is key and important, but also the tactical situation, how you maintain tactical control is, is, is also vital. So it's, it's kind of tough, um, but once you get used to that decision-making process, uh, you apply that over and over again. And isn't it true, though, uh, Ryan, that when you are actually training, things go wrong for real? Absolutely. I mean, submarines are the most complex platform that uh, the British military own and operate in a, a void less explored than space. And things do go wrong. I mean, I used to be, before I was teacher, I also used to work for Flag Officer Sea Training, basically coaching and, and preparing teams for operations. And things did go wrong during the training. But it's for the crew and the team that's providing the training to recover those situations. And can you tell me about one of those situations in particular that you write about in the book? It's a, it's a near collision. 
Yeah, and that's an actual event that happened when I was teaching um, the submarine command course. So we were basically the frigates that they're, they're, they're conducting opposition, and my guidance to the captains of those frigates was to make it as warlike as possible. And in that particular case, um, the duty captain was uh, bringing the submarine to periscope depth to look for the frigate and for other activity. And of course, the frigate was completely silent; it was stopped, and it was only by chance. And it was by chance. I looked at the sonar screen and went, "Something's not right there." tapped on it and um, immediately they put up the periscope and there in front was the frigate really 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 close the periscope watchkeeper went deep in emergency and you could see pure fear if you wanted to see fear you could see fear on his eyes as he was looking out through the periscope and at that point I took control of the submarine went deep in emergency we avoided the frigate avoided uh, basically colliding with the frigates got the situation back under control and then handed it back to the duty captain at any point, uh, did you actually worry or was it literally your training that kicked in? So, I mean, that was my third submarine command course that I'd taught and I'd been a submarine captain for three years and four months and also an XO of a submarine. So being calm, being considered and, and dealing with it, um, you, you just, you're just you just going to deal with it and you're going to get out of it. And I'd, I'd say I've, I've also been in worse positions and got out of those. So actually, everybody did what they were supposed to do. It was a really impressive team event and we, we avoided the collision. Uh, the course is called The Perisher. Why, in your view, is the submarine command course the most demanding of its kind in the world? There's nowhere to hide. That's the first thing. You are completely visible 24-7 for as long as the course is to the crew uh, and to people who are teaching and assessing you. That's that's the first thing. The second thing is the decision making. You, you're, you, the decision making you're expected to do, either strategically or tactically, is exceptionally difficult. The impact of those decisions can impact politically, for example, if you get it wrong. And so it tests all of that. You're a bit sleep deprived during that period of time because there's a lot of, lot of stuff going on. Um, you're expected to have expert knowledge of uh, various submarine operating processes, uh, as well as the enemy, as well as the environment. And you're operating in a three-dimensional um, three environment where um, finding a way out of, it, uh, of, of trouble is, is really difficult to do. So that, that creates its own pressure. And then there's self-generated pressure from the student themselves. They, they, they want to pass the course. I, I, when I did it, I really wanted to pass the course. I really wanted to be uh, you know, in command of submarine and lead on board a submarine, and I did not want to fail. And that actually sometimes puts more pressure on you. And how much experience do you have when you do the perisher, and how many do pass? So you'd expect somewhere between seven and ten years submarine experience by the time you get to the course. The pass rate at the moment is about 60%, um, and that sounds like a very low pass rate for a course that costs about a million pounds per student to, to put them through the oh. course um, The uh, in cash terms. But you want the best, right? You, you need the best people to be leading on those amazing platforms with amazing crews. So I think that pass rate is pretty much the same. It's probably about 60% pass and 40% fail. And despite the dangers, collision, enemy detection or hostile action, fire, you say submarine command has always been and will always be about people. Correct. So you could have the most complex platform in the world or you could have something less complex. And the best submarines that and I've, I've been with, uh, I've served with other navies and I've visited other navies to see their submarines, submarine crews operating. And it's always about the crew. You could give a platform that is less capable to an amazing crew and they will achieve huge amounts of results. And so the, the, the bit you really need to invest in is the crew itself. Ryan Ramsey, former commander of HMS Turbulent, on his new book, A View From Below. And you can hear much more from Ryan about his leadership lessons for us all from the submarine command course, what he learned from his most perilous moment commanding a sub, and whether any of it helps him as a football referee. That's in an extra edition of Sit Rep Podcast online now. Uh, Mike, um, before we go, we need to talk about the leadership of defence in the USA and the fact it was seemingly absent when the Secretary of Defence Lloyd Austin was taken into hospital and President Biden wasn't told for three days. If you wrote it in a TV drama, people would call it ridiculous. 
Yes, they might. I mean, I think the, the way it seems to have happened is that Lloyd Austin thought he'd be in and out of the hospital and it was complicated. And so he stayed in there for a while. Um, but the fact that, that the, uh, the Secretary of State was in hospital, his deputy was in charge, but nobody else seemed to know that. And the president didn't know that. That was uh, remarkable. And, you know, it reminds me, I mean, one of my favorite films is Dr. Strangelove, which was produced <laughs> in uh, 1964. It was Stanley yeah. Kubrick's masterpiece. And I've seen it many, many times since. And of course, it's all about a surreal satire on strategic and nuclear decision making. And every time I see it, I tick off another element that could well have been in the film. And so <laughs> the more I see Dr. Strangelove, the less surreal it appears and the more it seems like a bit of a drama documentary. And this is one of those events which I tick off as, oh, yes, that's a Strangelove moment. Yeah, I think we did say we we're going to watch it together at some point, didn't we? Um, the White House has called communications about the issue suboptimal. Uh, but equally, how worried should we be that the White House didn't actually notice for three days that the Secretary of Defence was absent? Yes, when that happens, you tend, to, you tend to say, well, what are you doing in the job then if nobody notices when you're not there? I'm sure that's not true in this case. But th this yeah. is a severe um, lapse in normal procedures. And I think it probably shows that the Pentagon is fully occupied with worrying about what's going on in Gaza, what's going on in the Red Sea, what's going on in Ukraine, and the mm -hmm. White House too. And, you know, we often say that all decision-making systems can cope with one crisis, but they find it they're overloaded when it comes to coping with two or three simultaneously and then relatively minor things like this just fall through the cracks i think that's what's happened here mike good to speak to you thanks so much and my thanks to all of our guests that is all for now professor michael clark and i will be back with another sit rep next thursday until then you can stay up to date with everything that's happening on our news website forces.net for now though from me kate Chabot, thank you for listening bye-bye 